Thank you so much for joining us. And I'm Zakria, um, an author, uh, somebody who helps uh, a lot of people with mental health, um, and Shaista Aziz, who is also not just one of the leading um, politicians helping inclusivity in the UK, especially for the diaspora community, um, and uh, inclusion overall um, for everyone in the UK, especially the homeless, people who are essentially marginalized, uh, both these people are extremely um, precious in the work that they do for um, marginalized communities. So thank you so much, Anam and Shaista, for being with us today. Hello, thank, thank you. you. So Shaista, we'll start with you. Um, you're joining us from the UK uh, right now, from Oxford particularly. What's it like in the UK um, in the context of what we're speaking about? And what we're speaking about is COVID and the confinement that people are feeling um, during the lockdown. Um, and, you know, we have a mutual friend, um, uh, Mona Alknawi, and she recently put up a post about confinement and doors and how, like, doors are closing in on a lot of vulnerable people and a lot of vulnerable communities. So what's it like in the UK, particularly in the context of confinement? So, first of all, thank you for arranging to have this conversation. I think it's really important. Um, so we are... Um, still behind Italy in terms of numbers of deaths, but very horrifically the numbers of deaths are spiking in the United Kingdom. We've had um, a number of doctors who happen to be of um, Muslim heritage and also immigrants who've died. Um, we've also had a nurse of Pakistani heritage who died at the age of 36, which is just deeply devastating for everybody concerned. Um, and the issue of confinement is very interesting because here in the UK, we, um, we have a, a housing crisis and a homelessness crisis, which has been exasperated by more than 10 years of austerity, by the failed politics of the current government. And the reason why I'm bringing this to the table in relation to the question you asked me is because if you look across the board, what we're seeing is that communities of colour um, migrant communities, uh, etc., et are the ones who are living in the most overcrowded housing in the mm. whole of the country. They are, they are the people who are being hardest hit by this crisis. And indeed, before this crisis started, they were being hardest hit. So, for example, um, because of the way uh, working class Pakistani families live in this country, or indeed working class Bengali families, or Sudanese families, or Somali families, what we see is um, generations of families living together as part of the connected family system. Yeah. And this means that there's, there's overcrowding in small spaces, and it makes it harder for people to self-isolate. Mm -hmm. um, we also know that um, a number of our elders, for example, have been hospitalized. Um, a number have sadly lost their lives. Um, it's a frightening time for people. Um, but I think this issue of confinement is something that is far more widespread and it's been an issue for a very long time. Um, there's mental confinement, mm. there's physical confinement, there's p political confinement. So I think this is all being exposed, but there's still the majority of people don't want to see it. You know, what I find really interesting, Shaisa, in the commentary that you've provided is that people of colour, um, even in the UK, I mean, which is the epicenter of, uh, you know, COVID. Um, and, and this is what the other thing is, like, you know, we've seen dis differences between race and class, but uh, a, a novel, novel virus like COVID does not distinguish between race or class. And it's actually the weakest link. Um, is, and that's what makes a society strongest. So it's like for the, for the longest time, um, these governments, these really rich governments have ignored poor people, have ignored the space per person in which they're living, um, bad sanitary conditions, bad hygiene, poor um, living conditions. And now that they are, you know, sort of like proliferating that the challenge of um, a virus like COVID, it's like, you can't blame poor people for anything anymore, you know? So it's like a bit of well, a actually, conundrum. Yeah, well, what I'd say is poor people continue to be blamed across the world. I mean, we saw in India, for example, mm -hmm. migrant workers were being forcefully sprayed with pesticides and chemicals, horrific levels of chemicals. So across the world, poor people are blamed every day for um, multiple crises that are actually being developed on the backs of their labor, um, badly paid labor, exploited labor. Um, 
the, the other thing I just want to throw into the mix here, Aisha, is, is very interesting because I know in Pakistan public space, especially for women, mm. is not it's not public. It's public space. No, most places in the world is not really for everybody. It's very much about your class and about your gender and about you know how you can access that space. And right now in the United Kingdom, we have a dis- debate going on about the government saying to people, if you don't stay in your homes, we will have to elongate the lockdown we will have to make it stricter and the fact of the matter is if you live in a high-rise building and disproportionately people of color with children live in these high-rise buildings you have no access to a garden the only access you have to any greenery is a park so if you don't understand that people will go to the park Mm. to be able to survive to be able to get fresh air in their lungs then I think that that's another problem which is adding to all the kind of dysfunctionalism that we're seeing in terms of how this pandemic is really revealing the gross inequalities uh, in de- the rich developed world. Look at New York, for example. Yeah. And it's equally shining another microcosm like uh, on um, what's happening in the so-called developing world as well. For sure. And Anam, with that, I want to come to you about the specificity of what it means for confinement for say vulnerable communities like women. So if you could give us a Pakistan based context. Um, so here's a woman who, you know, has never really been allowed to leave the house mostly without permission. And now the people who confine her are in her little space. So not only is she in an or any vulnerable person, say children or women or elderly, not only are they confined now, they are also in a hostile situation in a place that, you know, the men or the the abusers used to go away and now they're not going away. Now you're face to face with your abuser, most likely. And there is and there is uh, more conflict. So just context in terms of numbers, France released that. 30% increase of domestic violence has taken place um, because of the confinement. And that's France. Um, And so I'm imagining with the reports that 10, nine out of 10 women in Pakistan get abused. We are probably seeing a a worse, uh, you know, pandemic than COVID in terms of our, how many women are facing violence. So if you could lay the land for us, uh, Anam. Yeah, sure. Then, firstly, Asha, thank you so much for organizing this. I think this is a very important conversation to have, and I would like to echo a lot of what was already said by Shaista. I think that we're going to understand the full ramifications of what is happening right now, you know, months into this, even years into this. I, I don't even think it's... Uh, we've really even scratched the surface in terms of how much this is going to affect people and it's proportionately so. So, you know, I don't buy into the argument that this is a great equalizer at all. I think that vulnerable populations are always disproportionately affected. And, you know, we can already see that certain communities are much more hard hit um, than others. One of the things that I think is happening in, in Pakistan is that we're very much dependent on our social networks. We don't have a very strong government welfare support system at all. So the people, you know, uh, people who are in these situations, other kind of dire financial situations and otherwise will depend on family and relatives and friends. And that's completely been snapped off right now. So suddenly you're confined and, uh, you know, you don't have those resources that you earlier had as well. And you don't have strong government system um, to rely on either. So I think for everybody, this is, uh, you know, this is triggering old anxieties. This is triggering, uh, you know, our kind of uh, fears of death and all of that. So there's a mental health kind of impact that I think is going to continue to unfold. But when it comes to women, um, and as you mentioned, you know, we already know alarming rates of abuse uh, stories are coming in. We know that in India, for example, I was reading that in fact, abuse is now being underreported, which is also very significant because suddenly you're seeing a drop in the number of complaints. Yeah. And why is that happening? Because the abuse is now at home, so you don't mm. even have the space to mm. actually document or, or to reach out regarding that abuse, right? Um, I know that even, uh, you know, when it comes to war, when it comes to conflict or any natural disaster, when women are confined um, and they are confined with the abusers, you, you generally see a spike in that abuse. When I was working in Kashmir on the line of control and when women have to hide with children in bunkers, that's when you see sexual abuse happening from community members, from family members. 
So unfortunately, um, I think we don't even have a clear sense of how bad this is going to be because a lot of this is going to remain confined within public spaces. Um, but yes, we should expect that there is much more abuse happening right now and that people don't have their usual kind of, you know, uh, resource network, social networks to reach out to. I also think that um, this is not just about physical abuse. This is not just about sexual abuse either. There's going to be a lot of verbal and emotional abuse. Yeah, yeah. I think women right now disproportionately have to carry the emotional burden as well as, you know, the domestic burden in addition to having, you know, um, a possibly work responsibilities as well as additional family members at home to take care of. So uh, this is definitely going to disproportionately um, affect women as well so as other communities. Very well articulated, Anam, because again, we, when we say abuse, we think oh, somebody's got a black eye or a broken jaw or a broken fracture. Uh, but it's really about that um, psychological torture where everybody has limited resources. They cannot go out. Mobility is limited. And suddenly women are the typical scapegoats um, of in-laws. And usually, up, you know, when you live in a joint family system, that is unfortunately what you deal with. Um, you mentioned your work, your work in conflict zones. You have, mashallah, got three books, perhaps even more, about extensive research in conflict zones. So before I go to Shaista, if you can lay out what is uniquely very subcontinent about how our people deal with conflict. Um, and, you know, the, uh, human beings are generally the same everywhere, but what, what common threads have you seen in when resources are crunched and when there is conflict and when there is force, forced seizures or, you know, curfews, because masculinity really derives its, its power from the ability to control. Now, a lot of men can't go out. They have lost their jobs. There's economic uh, lack of resilience. What are some of the, the three, four things you're going to see in this area, in, in, in the subcontinent? So I don't know if this is only limited to the subcontinent. I think you just, you know, um, you hit the nail on its head when you say this is an issue of control. Um, anger for me is always a secondary response. So, you know, violence for me is always a response to some kind of underlying insecurity, anxiety, conflict that you feel you can only control by using physical force or verbal force, other kinds of force. Um, and that's what we've seen, you know, whether uh, when I was working on partition or more recently on 71 or in Kashmir, that when uh, your resource starved and when uh, men lose uh, their jobs and they're confined to the home space and they're trying to, you know, gain control, essentially, um, a lot of that anger gets deflected onto and displaced on women and children. Um, as well as, you know, um, uh, domestic staff at home, anybody essentially who is in a more vulnerable position. So I think we're going to see that. But uh, what I have also, I mean, not to put a positive spin on this at all, but what I've also noticed, you know, one of the common themes in all uh, the research I've done are rescue stories as well. So you will have community members, you know, uh, relatives and friends. Again, like I'm saying, you know, social networks become so critical. They can be, they can be at the center of abuse but mm -hmm. they can also be at the center of relief efforts. Yeah. So what I do think and what I think is already happening in Pakistan is that a lot of people at, um, at just at a social level, at a private level, at a relational level are mm -hmm. going to be reaching out um, as well because you really don't have those systems and procedures um, kind of institutionalized. Um, so, so people will step forward, which, which is something positive I've always seen. You know, people have risked their lives at partition. People risked their lives, uh, you know, at the birth of Bangladesh. Uh, people from opposing communities came forward and helped each other, took care of each other's properties, gave refuge. So I think, I think we will see that, but that does not take away from the fact that, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of violence. Um, you know, this pandemic, in a sense, is, of course, uh, it is violence on us. It's, it's changed the way we can even interact and take care of loved ones. It's changed the way we can even mourn death. So there's all kinds of, you know, new violence that we're going to be encountering, uh, but it's also going to lead to um, violence against minorities, against children, against women, um, transgender populations, so against different kind of marginalized communities, unfortunately. Shaista, uh, Anam's brought out a really important point here, which is that you rely in um, trust-based societies like ours on the kindness of our communities, on the kindness of our strangers. But the reason that didn't work is because most people are not kind. And most people, when in times of crisis, become mean and horrible and violent. And that's why you have laws. And that's why you have a formal judicial system. 
what is it like in the UK? Is it really a sophisticated system that protects people from abuse like this in, for, for, in times of war and crises? Well, I'd like to start by answering your question by saying, actually, I believe inherently that people are good and that they, uh, in times of crisis in particular, they come through for each other. And we are seeing this increasingly around the world. We're seeing this here in the UK, which is the sixth richest country in the world. Let's not forget that, okay? So we've had um, huge numbers of volunteers across the country coming together, uh, organizing online, organizing on, on mobile phones. Um, and uh, they've created like mutual aid groups. The idea behind these mutual aid groups, even the name itself is about, mm. uh, it's not about creating a transactionary relationship. It's about creating fluid, horizontal power structures and ensuring that um, people are um, able to get what they need in terms of maybe access to food, maybe getting medicine dropped at their homes. Even we have, we have a pandemic of loneliness in this country, which is devastating, where there's many elders, I refuse to call the people elderly, but elders who um, are going days without hearing from anyone. So there's a network of volunteers who are picking up the phone and calling people, for example. Now, some of these things are unheard of in um, the context of Pakistan, for example, where, you know, your elder is not going to, is going to be at the epicenter of your family unit, whether you agree with them, whether you like them or not, that's by the by. They are not going to be feeling that level of loneliness so I think that's the first thing to say and then um, to say that they there was a safety net in this country it was called the welfare state mm. it was created by the Labour Party it was very much created by the workers of this country mass numbers of um, migrants who came to this country immigrants who came to this country people like my you know working class family who came to this country they created the NHS they created the safety net of this country mm. but over um, decades of underfunding and deliberate political vandalism uh, it's been destroyed and now we are in a situation where we have I think this is very similar to what we saw in Pakistan uh, during the war on terror years mm. where the middle class became depleted and yeah. it started falling into the ranks of the working class and the working class fell lower into the underclass okay so in the last month for example we've had a hundred nearly hundred thousand people apply to uh, access universal credit which is a form of state welfare Mm. Now, the system is, it, during that period of time of a month, on, usually there'd be about nine, there'd be about 100,000 applicants, uh, there'd be, you know, compared to what we have now, there's a significant increase in the number of people applying for these to credit. And what it is, is most people have had their eyes wide shut, so they've been walking around, not understanding the reality of their neighbour, the person who lives across the road from them, not understanding how they've been struggling to make ends meet. So I feel that, I don't believe that we're all in this together, just to be very clear, but I do believe that there's suddenly been this um, massive jolt of reality that's shocking people. And I know you wanted to specifically talk about mental health as well, Aisha. And I feel that in Britain, in particular, people are not encouraged to talk about their feelings. They're not encouraged to... Um, ever divulge how they feel and I was listening to um, someone recently who was talking about the difference between being present mm. which is about just being there mm. and being connected and being connected is being in, in touch with your emotions with your feelings um, being in touch with what's going on around you mm. and I see every day a mental health crisis really I do I don't use these words lightly um, there's panic um, Lots of people are talking about suffering insomnia, very stressed out people, again, due to the confinement. But I think that this confinement has been going on for a long time in this country mm. because of the cultures that have manifested because of the capitalist state that we live in. OK, when you're running around like a hamster in a wheel, when you're just going round and round in circles, you don't have time to process how you're feeling. You have time to connect with people. And one thing that this crisis has done has made people stop forcefully stop and I think for people to have time on their hands to have to think about what's happening is really frightening yeah because because you you're um you're up against that system that you've been part of and you know you see these I and Anam said this that it's not like it's an equalizer the the virus has if anything polarized people together uh, uh you know completely separately so you have the rich going to the farms 
and considering this a holiday, you know, with their staff and isolating themselves because they have access to big, large spaces of confinement. And you have the middle class who basically never had time to sit and plan and save anyway, um, that are now up against the wall because they've re just realized they've put 20, 30 years into something that wasn't their own. They basically, it's, it's, it's a form of modern slavery capitalism where you pretty much trade your time and your creativity and your will and your spirit against some money at the end of the month out of which the government takes a really large part. And the whole point was that when something like COVID hits, the government would take care of us. And I think globally what we're realizing is that that wasn't part of the plan at all. So if, you can, if I can just uh, remind you that the question was really about the law and, and I'm so glad you brought everything up as well, but because you're part of the political process there, you know, can you tell me what is it about the law that we should hark back to when it comes to times like these? What, what are those laws specifically um, that, that societies need? Well, I think the first law is one of human compassion and dignity. It needs to be at the foundation of everything. And, you know, these all sound like really nice kind of idealistic, you know, um, beliefs, don't they really? But I think what we're seeing is it doesn't matter how rich you are. Mm. Um, when a virus strikes, it's going to affect your body. In the, it's going to affect your body and ultimately it's going to destroy and, and you know, create devastation. And, you know, as, as a Muslim, you know, I'm taught that, you know, whether you're a pauper or whether you're a king, you end up in the same place, right? You're going to go, you leave the world in the same way. And we're seeing that now. We're seeing people not being able to hold funerals. We're seeing um, that, you know, you, it, one of the most devastating things about this is you go into the hospital alone and then you leave alone, right? And we've, we've heard, we had testimony over the weekend from British South Asian doctors talking about um, being on a COVID ward with patients who don't speak English, who have South Asian heritage and how frightening it is for them mm -hmm. to be gasping for air, literally gasping for air and not knowing what's going on around them. Mm -hmm. And it's just so, it's so horrific. But yeah, so I think the laws, you know, the laws, as I said to you, is one of human decency and dignity and compassion but then if you look at the actual text of law if you want to talk about that just very quickly i mean we need a fundamental redistribution of wealth we need to really um we need to really work out as human beings do we feel that the way that we're living is actually in sync with nature is it in sync with with order and it's not um I, I'm, a, I'm an optimist. I don't believe, though, that this is going to change the world fundamentally. I'm really sorry. It, it, I don't. I believe that we have to work much harder at mm -hmm. making change. And, and I think right now the world is in trauma. OK, yeah. now many people in the world have been living in trauma for, for decades and decades and decades. And the, and the minority world, the rich world, didn't were part of the, the equation for their trauma and they just did not want to register it. And I think now we're seeing a mass trauma and it's going to take quite some time for people to shake off that trauma and that fear and then start working towards creating uh, laws that are actually compatible with human dignity. I think that's a fantastic point. Um, the, the United Nations chief actually talked about um, the fact that human security is a fundamental right. And when we talk about human security, it's not just, oh, you fortify a person, you know, make sure that nobody comes and kills them or hurts them. You fortify their human dignity. You do not put them down, includes, you know, and Chaisa, you do this a lot. You talk about how racism interacts with um, crisis, how bigotry interacts with crisis, Islamophobia, you know, sexism, all of those things we've seen that the people who are most uh, treated with indignity are the people who have the least amount of power, according to the system. Anam Shaista also said something very important. She said the entire world is in trauma. Your work, I think, has done fundamental um, understanding of how trauma is stored in the body, how acute trauma over many years of lack of treatment, you know, takes double the time to heal. Can you talk to us about trauma? And a lot of people are like, oh, I might not have been physically hurt, so therefore I'm not in trauma. But a lot of people are also saying that this is a grieving process. So what is trauma? And how do you know you have trauma? And what are maybe five, six symptoms that a person should understand that maybe they have clinical depression or are under a lot of PTSD? I think, I mean, I think trauma manifests very differently for different people. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't want to uh, 
like simply classified in any way because I feel like you know it comes up at different intervals for people it comes up in different ways but as you said you know we do store trauma there's so much work around this now that we store trauma in our body and you know years later um, decades later sometimes we you know can be in a setting where a particular smell or a song or a sound can just kind of send our body into this kind of physical reaction and response even though intellectually we may not be uh, able to understand what has happened um, so I think that that there is definitely you know uh, trauma with what is happening we you know people so many people have lost and in many countries now uh, you know you know people um, there, this is no longer a situation that is happening elsewhere. This is a situation which is increasingly becoming more and more personal. And I think in moments like this, you know, you're not just dealing with the immediate trauma. You also are, are kind of, you know, your older traumas, traumas around death, traumas around losing a loved one, traumas around abuse, traumas around loss, around grief. All of those are also kind of being triggered. And through my work, I know that trauma is something that gets passed on intergenerationally. And the reason I say, you know, it manifests in different ways is because for some people, you know, it manifests in terms of expression, other people, it manifests in terms of silences. Um, so I think that we really, this is a time we, when, when it's really hard because there's so much going on and often we are at home with many, many people and it's so hard um, to find a new time. Uh, but in whatever way possible, you know, I think it is increasingly important to kind of tune in with yourself, uh, whether that's through writing, whether that's through listening to music, whether that's through just, you know, trying to get any kind of physical energy. I know a lot of people are taking care of children at home right now too, so whether that means kind of waking up earlier or Going to bed later or you know carving out a particular you know set of hours every week even one hour uh, which is just yours um, so you can just kind of sit down with this because I think what this may not be giving a lot of people a chance to do is pause um, and just see well how is this impacting me in the here and now but how is this also kind of triggering and it doesn't have to be trauma but how is this triggering my anxieties you know I think one of the things that um, we are all, you know, very quick to do when we feel any kind of anxiety, any kind of trauma is, is reach out for a defense mechanism. And we all have them. Some can be more functional than others for certain people, but, you know, essentially a lot of us are able to kind of mask underlying vulnerabilities and anxieties under high functionality. Uh, for a lot of people that actually means stepping outside the house, getting busy with work, working out and so forth, socializing could, could take so many forms. And I think what's happened right now now is all those defense mechanisms are suddenly dismantled. Right? People, people don't know what to do anymore because everything you reached out to when you it's previously gone. were dealing with any kind of emotional or stress, they're gone. And so I think this is just, you know, I know a lot of people are saying, well, then maybe this is going to give us time to, to see what, what wasn't functional for us. And that's true. But I think for a lot of other people, it's also going to trigger so much and it's going to be hard to just contain it and to deal with this. I think this is a time when we should be willing and ready to reach out, even if we feel like we're doing okay, uh, because we all are going through a process. That's all I'll say about trauma. You know, it doesn't have to be um, uh, like, uh, you know, like a certain quantity of trauma, a certain number on trauma, how serious is your trauma, is it physical trauma or not? I just think that this is a time when we need to realize that we're going through stuff. Yeah. We're going through, you know, stuff from our past. We're going through stuff in the present. We don't know anything about the future. It's uncertain. And one thing we love doing is, you know, having some sense of control. And we don't have that right now. Yeah. So, you know, how am I trying to create that sense of control right now? What parts of that are, you know, functional? What are dysfunctional? How is it affecting people around me? And who are my resource persons? I know that therapy is something that is not necessarily affordable, nor necessarily the right medium for a lot of people. It is absolutely impacted by class. It's also impacted by gender, by notions of sharing. But I do think that everybody can, you know, um, try to create their own safety plan or resource plan. What are those things that make you feel a little bit more grounded, a little bit more nurtured, you know, a little bit more resourceful, whether that's talking to friends, you know, uh, creating a list of people you can reach out to, things that you can do. So I think those are really important um, things to arm ourselves with, even if we don't feel like we're necessarily going through a massive trauma right now. Thank you, Anam. I think those are very practical steps you can do. I think I'll just summarize. You said carve out some silent time for yourself, write, journal, reach out to a friend, maybe have a meditation corner. Prayer is really encouraged in our society. So that's your like, you know, your own personal zone. I think articulating that, you know, this is a difficult time is the beginning of it and all of that. 
Um, Shaista, I want to come to you and, and, and wrap up also. What are some of the habits that, you know, because you work with homeless people as well, and you had that beautiful story about how there was a homeless woman outside one of the restaurants and, you know, you asked her if she needed something and she said, you know, um, I'm fine or something. And then you insisted and she said, I want uh, coffee or something, right? Um, so I think it was a really cute story because we tend to forget that just because we're suffering and we have anxiety um, that the universe revolves around ourselves, you know, but if we think about it, we have a lot of privilege. We have a roof over our heads. We have running water. 40% of Pakistan doesn't have running water, you know, and we're talking about washing hands all the time and sanitizers. You know, this is not the reality of a lot of people in, in developing countries. What are some of the human dignity elements that we need to remember while we're going through trauma? Because I know that one way to heal trauma is to serve and to help and to help those you know, less fortunate than us. So perhaps give us that story one more time about that woman and, and how does one create compassion and how does compassion heal our own trauma? Yeah, well, I think the first thing to say is that when I think it's perfectly okay for want of a better word if somebody is feeling overwhelmed to just feel overwhelmed we don't have to be busy trying to manage being tr tr stressed or traumatized or feeling overwhelmed i think we just have to allow this to to seep through our bodies and to pass sometimes and i think we've got to this kind of like this is this whole uh, capitalism is a constantly trying to repackage ways for us to live right so even with the whole tr the trauma self-care all these things they've just become part they've become kind of like a capitalist commodity yeah. so i just think it's really important for us to be able to sit with discomfort and unhappiness and really difficult feelings and just to let it sometimes settle and then to work out how we want to deal with it so that's the first thing the second thing is um as you rightly say i think all of us it doesn't matter how rich privileged we are how poor we are whatever however we classify ourselves um, there is always someone out there who's going to be in a far worse situation than you. It's, it's just a fact, right? And I think the, the key to the human dignity is to never remove people's agency, to never feel like you know what's best for them and to demand that they do as you want, wish for them to do, right? Um, and then in terms of the homelessness story I was talking about, um, I live in one of the richest cities in the whole of the United Kingdom and in Europe. This is Oxford, the city of dreaming spires where the university is. And among, amongst these Harry Potter-esque buildings, right, which tourists come from around the world to come and see, you have large numbers of people sleeping on the streets of this country, sl sleeping on the streets of this city. And it's the juxtaposition. You cannot get a more violent shocking image and it is all about capitalism as well it's about a fractured broken society um so yeah so just very quickly you know i'm when i'm walking around doing my work i frequently meet people who are either experiencing homelessness or they're ex experiencing street homelessness and you know the first thing i'll try and do and i can't i don't do this all the time but i'll try my best to make eye contact with people to see them to acknowledge them, to listen to them. And nine times out of 10, people just want to be acknowledged, you know? They just want someone to say hello to them more than they want anything else. Um, so yeah, so I, I said to a woman, would you like a cup of, would you like anything? And she said, no. And it was really cold. And I said to her, I, you know, I'm gonna go and get myself a coffee, would you like one? And it took a lot of energy for her to say yes, because I honestly know through my work, and just through being a human being, that it's very rare that a human being will actually say what they need to a stranger. It's very rare, okay? Um, and often when I say, oh, you know, have you eaten? Would you like some food? I, I, have you eaten? I don't remember. That's the response. Because there's a lot of pride there. There's a lot of dignity there. People, despite the myth that everyone's out begging and asking for something, you know, that's not true. Um, and so, yeah, these have been my experiences, you know, and I just feel that what we have to do is we have to start seeing each other as human. Yeah. This is not an automatic. And you're talking about um, cultivating compassion. I do. I used to think compassion was something that we were born with. Now I understand that it's, it's about nurture. It's about being nurtured. Yeah, it's like a muscle. And to feel. Yeah, it is right. And what we have in the West in particular is blockages of muscles. I have, I know so many people. Um, we've gone to the best universities, have amazing jobs, and they just don't feel anything. Yeah, and it's because they've become robotic. You know, those ones are the worst. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. So I think what we have to do is we just have to remember that our jobs don't defi define us. Mm. Our fancy job titles don't define us. Our massive pay packets don't define us. Sure as hell, they make your life easier. No one's going to deny that. But at the end of the day, they don't define us. What defines us is the human connection that we have with each other. Mm. And I don't believe that anything is going to radically change, by the way. Really, I don't. I feel that what's going to happen in the interim years after this crisis is there will be multiple crises and there will be more uh, people looking inward um, and trying to kind of uh, protect what's theirs, inverted commas. And then from that, we will see the change we need to see. Mm. Thank you, Shaista. Um, Anam, before um, you go, one last question. In the South Asian context, we have a lot of class and we have a lot of cheap labor and we have a lot of mates. And you mentioned that most people who are likely to abuse or uh, receive abuse our children, the elderly women, and of course your home staff, right? Um, I also feel that what's happening in a lot of the rich defense Clifton type societies is you're telling your maids to uh, go off without paying them. Um, and I think that that is something worth reiterating that when you have a contract um, and there's an act of God, which COVID-19 is, it's an act of God, it's not fair to not pay somebody when you've already contracted. Con, uh, you know, ha ha entered a contract into, uh, into them. So is there a message for people who don't recognize their, their privilege and also who people who don't recognize they're breaking the law when they're disrespecting people, um, especially domestic home staff? Thank you so much for being part of this. Really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, uh, we have your Twitter IDs there and your contact so people can reach you for further questions. Thanks again. Really appreciate you being a part of this. Thank you. Take care.